Turn your Bibles. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you didn't bring a Bible, we have one out at the, uh, the introduction or the uh, welcome table at the, in the lobby. And if you're new to the Bible, you can find 1 Thessalonians by looking at the very beginning of the, of the Bible in the table of contents. This is a book in, in the New Testament, near the end of the New Testament. And we're in the fourth chapter. And the fourth chapter is that large number, four. And then we're going to be in the 13th verse, and that's the small number, 13. And I will say that I wish, considering the circumstances of having kids and being a new place, that I was preaching a nice, short sermon. But if you, when we read this passage, you'll see why. It's going to take some time, but it's going to be fascinating. So I, I can't wait to dig into the details of this text around Jesus' second coming. Can you guys all hear me okay in the back? Everyone hear me? Thumbs up? All right. So I went jogging on a beautiful, cool morning this week, and I took with me um, three children in the jogging stroller, as I sometimes do, and I never know where I'm going to end up when I'm jogging. I just start running, and then I, this, this past week on a Tuesday morning, I found myself jogging through a cemetery with three young children, and they're in the stroller, and my four-year-old is uh, has his two-year-old sister on his on his lap, and he says, "Dad, what are those big rocks?" And I dawned on me, I have to explain to a four-year-old what these cemetery stones are. And I explained to him, "Well, those are markers of the bo- of the bodies of people who have died." And there's a long pause from the four-year-old. People died here. How did they die here? And I'm like, well, we don't know how they died. They didn't die here, but their families put them here uh, after they died, and their souls went to the spiritual realm, and their bodies are here. I'm fumbling through my words, and he's like, so what's that? What's that name? And I read a name of a headstone to him. He keep running. What's that name? And I read another headstone to, to him. And it was a surreal experience to be pushing this stroller so full of life and future and vibrancy through the resting place of all of these dead bodies. Human beings that at one point, most of them were four years old, curious with questions. And as the pastor dad that I am, I explained to him about the resurrection and about how these bodies are bones or dust. And that one day Jesus is going to return and he's going to put everybody's body back together again. And we'll stand before God to be judged. And even as I was talking to this child, there was a voice in my head saying, that sounds really strange. Are you sure you believe that? And then it dawned on me that I have to preach this, this Sunday. Do I really believe this? We live in a secular age, and by secular I mean that many people in our day believe that this life is all that there is. And that there, even if there is something in the life to come, we can't quite know what that is. Um, so a, the secular view of the afterlife is captured vividly by, by Johnny Depp in a a Rolling Stone article. He was asked about what he believes about the age of comedy, and he says, I'm not sure life is supposed to mean anything at all. He says, but as long as you have the opportunity to breathe, breathe. As long as you have the opportunity to make your kids smile and laugh, move it forward. I think we're here, and that's kind of it. Then it's dirt and worms. Dirt and worms. And then he said, when he dies, he, he, for all he cares, they can throw his body off of a cliff and watch it bounce and hopefully it'll entertain some people. That, my friends, is a future without hope. Is that what you believe? So I, that's what many people in our age believe about life and about death. This is all there is. And then, after that, is dirt and worms. And that said, in one sense, it's possible to be a professing Christian and regularly attend church and functionally be secularists in our worldview. 
We can profess to believe in the afterlife, but live as if all that matters is this life. All that matters is politics, or reputations, or the accumulation of more things in this life. When the resurrection and the return of Christ and the eternal state occupy very little of our mind space, we are drinking in the spirit of our secular age. So we're preaching this series in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, about living in the present as people of the future. And we are striving to, to stir up within us a healthy obsession in the age to come, in the return of Jesus. So in this scripture about to read, the Apostle Paul seems to be answering some specific questions about what happens to those who die before Jesus returns. It seems that there was a, a really um, vivid anticipation of the return of Jesus in this church in Thessalonica. They thought he could die, or Jesus could, could return at any moment. And so they were concerned that some people had died. What happens to those people that die before Jesus returns? They're living with his expectation, which we would do well to live with that kind of imminent expectation of Jesus' return. And it's possible that some have been martyred um, through persecution for their faith. So, what happens to those who die in Christ when Christ returns? That's the question. Here's the passage. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18 says this. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is God's word. So it's tempting to turn this message into an argument about what does and does, what this does and doesn't mean about um, the end times and correct our assumptions we picked up from the left behind movies and the left behind books and. Uh, We'll go there some, but the purpose of this passage is not to make an argument, it's not to make a chart about the end times, it's not to argue about who's right and wrong. The purpose of this passage is to comfort and encourage Christians. These are words to be etched in, in gravestones, to be read at funerals, and the startling truth if I was going to sum up what Paul is saying here, the startling truth is this, is that there is no downside to death for those who hope in Christ. There is no downside to death for those who hope in Christ. That's not just a clever turn of phrase, that is exactly what Paul is saying here. And I'm certainly not advocating for suicide or demeaning this life, but Paul's words are words of comfort, that there is no there's nothing that people miss out on who die before Christ returns. There's nothing to fear in death for the believer. Now, obviously, you know, I'm not looking forward to the pain of dying. But really, you think about that. I'm not looking forward to the end part of my life. Death itself, after the period... There is no downside for those who hope in Christ. And that's the radical thing that Paul is arguing here. So my first question is, how can this be true? How can there be no downside to death? And then my first point is about how the dead in Christ are, are sleeping. Look at verse 13. It says, we do not, not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. Who are those who are asleep? Those are Christians who have died. Sleep is a common euphemism 
in the ancient world <coughs> for death. But Jesus in the New Testament pick up on this euphemism and use it. Chad, can you bring me that water, please? That's sitting right there. Thank you. Um, Jesus, when his friend Lazarus dies, Jesus shows up four days later. And what does Jesus say? He's not dead. He's sleeping. Right? In John 11, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And then there's another story where Jesus comes to the deathbed of a little girl. And the mourners are already there. And they're wailing and crying, professional mourners. And Jesus says, Mark 5, why are you making a commotion and weeping? This child is not dead, but sleeping. You see, one reason there is no downside to death for those who hope in Christ is that death is not the end. And to put it a little bit simply, death is a really long nap for believers. Who could go for a really long nap? Young mothers and fathers, yeah. And we'll be awakened with the voice of Jesus. Think about that. Just like Jesus said to Lazarus, come forth. Just like Jesus said to this little girl, Talitha Kumi, arise, little child. Jesus, we will awaken to the voice of Jesus. And though there's still grief for those who are left behind, Paul speaks to that grief. He says, he says negatively, he says it negatively. Let me, let me say it, it positively. He says, we want you to be informed, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you may grieve with hope. See, the Greeks and the Romans, they believed a very vague things about the afterlife. They were very uncertain about what happens after death. They believed in a, a shadowy afterlife. And that's the spirit of our secular age. Live in the now. Because all that's coming is, is dirt and worms and the light to come. So live it up. But for those who don't believe in Christ, grief and death is much deeper. Have you ever been to a funeral of a family who truly does not believe, doesn't have heavenly hope, does not trust in Christ? It is a devastating experience to watch people grieve without hope. So Paul, to be clear, he's not saying don't grieve the death of Christians. He's not advocating for happy, clappy funerals where everybody puts on plastic smiles and, and stuffs their emotions down and pretends like, no, I, I'm all happy, I'm not grieving, it's all hopeful. It's not what he's saying. We grieve, but we grieve radically differently. We grieve with a hopeful expectation of a reunion of an awakening at the end of this long sleep. And where does this hope come from? Paul goes on. This is the second reason why there's no downside to death. But the, the, dead, the dead in Christ will be raised when Christ returns. The dead in Christ will be raised when Christ returns. This is not a hope grounded in us. Listen, Paul does not say, for since we are trying our best to be good people, he doesn't say, for since we obey the Bible the best that we can and we're trusting God to do the rest. That's not what he says. Verse 14, for since we believe, we believe what? That Jesus died and rose again. The gospel. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Everything centers on Jesus. It's Jesus who died on the cross as a sacrifice for sinners. It's Jesus who rose up from the dead and God said, I accept this sacrifice. And it's Jesus who in physical body is going to return and come again and bring those who are asleep and raise them from the dead when he returns. Now, it's going to get a little bit technical here. He says, bring. Bring from where? Where is Jesus bringing these dead believers from? I used to think that this passage meant that Jesus that he was going to bring our disembodied souls from the intermediate state. So the Bible teaches, you know, that when, when we die, there's an intermediate state where our souls are at rest. Paul says to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's better to be with Christ. 
and to live this life. And so there is this intermediate sleeping place with Christ. Um, and think about what is your soul? What is your spirit? What is that immaterial part about us? Scientists can study our brains. They can put them under a microscope. But then our soul cannot be put under a microscope. There's something invisible, immaterial about us that will not die. It goes to the intermediate state. That's one option. When Jesus brings our souls from that place. I think what Jesus is saying here, though, is that our bodies, the bodies of the dead will be resurrected. And based on the context, especially at the end of verse 16, I'm certain, actually, that Paul is talking about resurrection bodies. So I'm learning with you, right? Don't picture ghost-like souls flying in as an army behind Jesus when he returns. Picture human bodies that have been resurrected, that have been dead for centuries and millennia, being reconstituted and remade and reformed and erupting out of the grave. That's the picture here. He will bring those dead believers from the grave. And that's why there's no downside to death for those in open Christ, because Jesus is going to empty the cemeteries. Do you believe that? I believe that. My third point on this, how can there be no downside to death? The third point is that the dead in Christ will actually meet the Lord before those who are left alive. So, look at verse 15. For we declare, declare to you with the words of the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So if you want to look at a parallel passage later this afternoon, you're studying this, you've got question marks, go to Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. Write that down, Matthew 24 and 25, and the bulletin notes that I threw away. Um, a lot of the same imagery is being used here. Clouds, angels, shouts, trumpets. Um, Jesus is drawing from uh, Daniel chapter 7, when it talks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds, returning. And that's probably what Paul has in mind when he's talking about this we declare to you as a word from the Lord. Jesus taught about these things, he said. Look at Matthew 24, Matthew 25. And Paul says, we who are alive. He's not saying that he knows that he will be alive when Jesus returns. But he's saying, but he's living with such an eager expectation of Jesus returning that he believes that he could return any minute. Any minute. He could return in his lifetime. So those who are alive, when Jesus returns, have no advantage over those who are asleep. And those who are alive will actually meet the Lord second. And those who have died will meet the Lord first. So there's actually a benefit to dying first before Christ returns. You'll meet the Lord first. What will that look like? What will, what will that happen when Christ returns? And if you can believe it, he goes into more detail. That's really my second point. What will happen when Jesus returns? Wouldn't you like to know? I'm going to satisfy all your curiosity right now. Now, that's not true. But what we read here actually is probably the most detailed description of the return of Christ in the New Testament. So if we're going to find details, we're going to find them here. And this is where I need to remind you that the Left Behind series is a work of fiction. Okay? Kirk Cameron seems like a great guy. I'm not a hater. I love his passion for evangelism. But if this passage, passage brings to mind for you cars crashing because people have been secretly raptured, or if you've seen the movie, a little sweet old little old lady on an airplane whose husband is, is left is gone while she was sleeping on the plane, and his clothes are left behind. And she's, she asks her camera to go find her husband and says, take his clothes, because I think he might be naked. Like that, try not to read that in this text, all right? Even though I just suggested it to you. Um, look at what's here though. and there are four eschatological events here eschatology is the study of last things and so John Stott the commentator puts them in, in four simple R words I'm going to use them because we need some simplicity and complexity here first there's the return then there's the resurrection then there's the rapture and then 
there is the reunion. So let's look at the return of Christ. We'll look at it a little bit, but Paul goes into detail. Verse 16. For the Lord himself, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. See, world history will not go on forever and ever. People say that history is cyclical and that history repeats itself. But the future is linear. There will come a period, and that period is the return of Christ to this earth. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour. In the next chapter he goes on to talk about the return of Christ being like a thief in the night. But when he returns, Jesus will come down from the heavens in the same way that he was ascended up into the heavens. Remember when Jesus ascended, he said, I will return in the same way. And I think what's going to happen is that the heavenly realm is going to suddenly appear. It's going to be like a stage curtain being rolled back in the skies. And Jesus Christ will be revealed from the heavens. And I think all creation will see him with their eyes and hear him with their ears. And the present dimension, as we know it, will be ripped away. And what will be shown is, is the glorified Jesus Christ returning. It will be a glorious scene. It says the Lord himself, Jesus himself, will return. There's no intermediator. It's Jesus himself. There's going to be a cry of command. That cry of command is like a warrior's cry for battle. There's going to be the sound of an angel. Perhaps Michael is called the archangel in the book of Jude. There's going to be um, this imagery of the Hebrew scriptures that when God appears, there's, there's smoke and there's clouds. Christ will return for the last battle and he will strike down all who reject him and rebel against him. Reminds me of my favorite Johnny Cash song. When the man comes around, the chorus goes, Hear the trumpets, hear the pipers, 100 million angels singing. Multitudes are marching to the big kettle of drum. Voices calling, voices crying. Some are born, some are dying. It's the Alpha and Omega's kingdom come. Jesus himself will return. And all creation will see him. Secondly, what will happen is the resurrection. The dead in Christ will rise first before those who are alive. At the end of verse 16, the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who died hoping in Jesus will be resurrected. Just like Lazarus, every friend of Jesus will rise again. Brothers and sisters, do you think of heaven as some ethereal place where we float around like ghosts? I think, uh, um, what's the, the Larson, the, the creator of the far side, um, he gives us actually a lot of our images of heaven in our pop culture. Look at, look at this picture, this little comic of heaven, according to um, the far side. A guy with wings with wings on a cloud saying, I wish I brought a magazine. Right? And that does look boring, doesn't it? Eternal rest? Like, who wants eternal rest? They go on a nice long nap. But eternal rest? And I understand that if this is your understanding of heaven, why it sounds boring. And why you would not want to go there. And why you want to live it up in this life, even as a Christian. Eat, drink, be merry. Because heaven's going to be boring, right? We're just going to sit on clouds with the harps and the wings. First of all, let me correct a few things about this cartoon that might be in our heads. We don't become angels. Human beings become more fully human than we are now with our resurrection bodies. Our old bodies will be like a cocoon of what our future bodies will be. And we will emerge out of our current bodies into our resurrection bodies with glory. And secondly, our, 
an eternal state, final heaven, is not a bodiless existence. We're resurrected into bodies to live on the new heavens and the new earth. Believers will have heavenly bodies and we will live on a heavenly earth. It will be the opposite of born. It will be thrilling. It will be full of joy. If you ever you see beauty in this life with your eyes, you will see more beauty in the, in the new heavens and new earth. We only have five senses in this life. One of my heavenly speculations is that we will have more than five senses. We will have, we have the ability to experience pleasure beyond the five senses. I speculate, you know, you, you can see only so many colors with the human eye. I speculate that we'll be able to see more colors and more beauty with our heavenly eyes. Because the new heavens and the new earth will be holy love and holy joy, and I think holy fun, without end. And so, there's this teaching in this passage, it's often called the secret rapture, and um, that, that, that sees a secret rapture in this passage. Sometimes it's called the pre-tribulation rapture, and this is where it gets a little technical, so bear with me. Um, some people believe that this is teaching that Jesus will partially return and will hover in the clouds and that we will, believers will rise up to be with him and will go up into, into some heavenly place with Jesus and then there's going to be a seven year tribulation and then there's going to be that, that believers will be raptured out of secretly. That's where you get jokes about like, you show up and nobody's there, oh maybe they were raptured, right? Like, um, it's my opinion that it's not what this is teaching, what the Bible teaches. Um, but this is where people go for this passage. They get this from this passage. And then after the tribulation, there's taught it will be a thousand year millennium, a thousand year um, literal um, ruling of Christ on this earth, and then the final resurrection and the end will come. And I don't see it here, and this is the main place that people see it, and I don't see it here mainly because I see Jesus resurrecting believers into the eternal state right here. And I don't think pre-tribulation rapture is a heretical teaching. I went to a college that teaches this. I recommend people going to that college. Um, but from what I read here and what I read other places, this is talking about the full, final return of Jesus. There will be a resurrection. There will be a judgment, which is not talked about here, but it's talked about later in 2 Thessalonians. And then Jesus will set up the new heavens and the new earth. And we will be with him. And if you're confused, I'm sure you are, because I still am, and you're going to delve deeper into this, I'm going to send out a two-hour uh, debate on eschatology from four theologians and pastors that I very much respect. And they, they all have four different perspectives. It's two hours long. It's fascinating. You watch a movie for two hours, watch this debate. And it's a perfect example of, A, people debating with civility, which is a beautiful thing to see, and B, um, believers being able to separate what are the main things that we agree on and then what are some secondary things that are important that we can vigorously defend with passion and yet in the end disagree and say, I love you, you're my brother. So I encourage you to watch that um, because eschatology, some things are major things, the resurrection, the literal return of Christ, some things are secondary things. And so this is a secondary thing. And what's most clear is the return of Christ the resurrection, the rapture, not a secret rapture, and the reunion. So let's look at the rapture. This is where people get the rapture theology. Verse 17. Then we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So first, the dead in Christ are resurrected. And then the living in Christ, those who are left will be caught up. Caught up. This is, where the, this is where the word rapture comes from. We will be raptured. It's a Greek word that was translated into Latin, raptio. It's where we get our English word rapture. And like I said, I don't think this is a secret snatching away. Believers on airplanes, little ladies wondering where their husband went. This is the public, visible, loud return of Christ. This is the day of the Lord. 
This is the final day. And those who are in Christ will be caught up and carried away to meet Christ. This word meet is only used two other places in the New Testament. And it always just means going out to meet someone. In Matthew 25, in the same context of talking about the return of Christ, there's a parable of virgins waiting for the bridegroom to come. And that's the church. The church in purity, waiting for Jesus, the groom, to come. And they're running out of oil for their lamps. And at midnight, Matthew 25, there was a cry. At midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Same word. That's the word. Jesus is the bridegroom. His bride is the church. And there will come a day when believers will be snatched away, caught up, carried off to meet him. And in ancient Rome, when Caesar would, would come, would have a coming, of, a, a, an appearance, which is also used here in the background of 1 Thessalonians, the coming of Christ. Caesar would send a delegation to a city, and people would go outside of the city, and they would meet him, and they would honor him, and they would parade him into the city. That's the image here of Jesus finally, fully returning, and his church meeting him, and will be caught up in the air. And I've always pictured, like, literally will float up in the air. And this is where I'm not sure that that's going to happen. I think it might be figurative. The air is the space inhabited by the spiritual powers, by the devil and his demons, by angels. The devil is called the prince of the power of the air. And so we'll meet the Lord personally. We will meet him in this merging of, of heaven and earth, in the spiritual realm, in the physical realm, in the air. Maybe we'll be floating up. I don't think so. I do hope we can fly, though. But let's not get lost in the details. Anyone lost in the details? I'm a little bit lost in the details. All right. This is the climax that will go on. At the end of verse 17. And we will always be with the Lord. We will always be be with the Lord. From that point on, there will never come a time when we won't be with the Lord. That is the most beautiful part of this passage. Let's linger here with the greatest anticipation. I'm officiating a wedding this afternoon, and when you're engaged to be married and you love this person, the anticipation of always being with this person just sounds like such bliss. You'll always be with your spouse. In two years in a marriage, you're like, we can do some space, right? No, not us. Anyone but us. Um, but that's just a tiny taste of the eager anticipation that followers of Jesus have in always being with the Lord. Yes, we'll be reunited with brothers and sisters in Christ, and that will have its own glory. Yes, there will be fun and joy beyond our wildest imaginations. But the best thing about the eternal state is that we will always be with the Lord. There will never be a time when we're apart from Him. And if Jesus is not at the center of your excitement about heaven and the eternal state, then get to know Him more. Jesus is coming again. And he's going to bring the heavenly dimension and smash it together with his earthly place that we know. And he's going to be revealed from heaven. And we are going to stay here. And we're going to rule and reign with him in the heaven, new heavens and new earth for all eternity. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, We'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begin. Amen? There is no downside to death for those who hope in Christ. We're going to sing a song here that's called, It Is Not Death to Die. And that's not just something that we tell ourselves so we feel better about dying. We believe that. And we all need to prepare for death. Death is coming to us all. And Jesus 
came to free us from the fear of death. Because if we die before Jesus returns, we are just sleeping with the Lord, waiting for Him to come so that we can be caught up with Him and meet Him and be with Him forever. Now it is true that most people, many Christians and most of our neighbors are living in a constant fear of death. And COVID-19 has just kind of inflated our fears, right? But think about this. Originally, we were not created to live in the shadow of death. Death and the fear of death is a result of the fall into sin. Death casts a shadow over all of creation. And so we don't know what it's like to live in a world without the fear of death. I'm going to borrow an illustration from a pastor that I listened to, Andrew Wilson. He's in London. He used an illustration that was beautiful of a tarp. Death is like a tarp that has been cast over the whole world. See, there was a tarp cast over this auditorium, over the whole world. At first, we recognize it's annoying, it's dark, it's damp, it's like living under a mask. Who wants to do that, right? We would hate it. But after a few years or a few generations after, under this tarp, it would become the only existence that we know. And we would have innovations to make life more comfortable, and we would forget what it's like to live without this tarp of darkness and dankness being over us. But the tarp would still be there. Death is like a giant tarp that has been spread over our world, and it so pervades our lives that we don't even think about it until somebody dies or we get sick or we take a stroller to a cemetery and have to answer questions from a four-year-old. But think about this. When Jesus returns, he's going to remove that tarp. The final enemy to be destroyed is death. And Jesus is going to defeat death fully and finally. And we will live in a world of interrupted, uninterrupted joy and uninterrupted fearlessness. Imagine living life without the fear of death. Imagine this, imagine this conversation 3,000 years into the future. Hey, I had this dream last night, man. It was weird. I had this dream that, like, there was this place that people were, we were used to go to when we didn't feel well, and they would, like, put needles in our arms. And sometimes they would, like, cut us open and, like, take things out of us. Can you remember that? Like, uh, I vaguely remember that. It's like something like, a, like in a hospital. Yeah, I, I, it's the, the memory's fading. But could you imagine forgetting to fear death? If you trust Christ, if you hope in Him, you will. Jesus is coming again to, to strike a final blow for death itself and usher in a world of life eternal. Isn't that encouraging? Doesn't that just give you courage? And don't you just feel like you could sacrifice more for the gospel if you really believe that? Well, that's the purpose of this passage. What's the, what's the purpose of teaching on end times? Look at verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Brothers and sisters, as we live this life in community, decades in the past, one by one, we're all going to die. And we will weep for one another because we love each other. And we'll take out these words and we'll read them and we'll find comfort in them and we will speak them to one another. Church, this is not just my job as the pastor to encourage you with these words. Take up these words in moments of grief and encourage one another. No matter your age, death is closer than we think. So I'm just going to ask again, what is your hope beyond death? If you believe that it's only dirt and worms, then your hope is no hope at all. Even if you don't believe what I'm saying here to be true, doesn't a part of you wish it to be true? 
Wishing it to be true doesn't make it true. But there is something in us that knows that we are eternal. God has put eternity in our hearts. And if you're hearing this message and you don't believe that Jesus died and rose again and is coming again, the Bible teaches that this really is your best life. Hedonism is consistent with secularism. But the Bible teaches that all who reject Jesus and his offer of salvation will come under judgment in the life to come. And my friend, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we have this life and this life only to make right with God and to trust in his son Jesus and be saved from his wrath and be saved from his punishment forever. So put your trust in Jesus. If you're here, there are dozens of people here that would love to talk to you about what it looks like to follow Jesus and how to start following Jesus for the rest of your life. That way you can, you can face death, see that there is no downside, and you can live your life with hope.